Good evening and welcome to the April 24th uh, City Forum, uh, City Council meeting and public forum. And we will begin with a public forum. So just a reminder that if you're planning to speak, you have, well, the names are coming up, but you know, this is, this is your moment. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, the public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the City Council on any city-related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have three minutes to speak. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene, residence, ward if known. The timer lights indicate the time you have to speak. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. And just a reminder that uh, if, if someone is speaking to an issue and it's controversial, please be respectful. We try to keep a, a quiet space so everyone feels comfortable speaking. You can always show approval this way. And, um, and I think we're ready to begin. So our first speaker is Jennifer Frenzer Knowlton. Hi, my name is Jennifer Frenzer Knowlton and I'm in Betty Taylor's ward. Um, my first comment is about your upcoming work session on Wednesday the 26th at noon here. Um, on behalf of the Eugene Human Rights Commission, I'd like to express our thanks for holding that work session concerning um, public emergency shelter. Um, our commission supports developing indoor public shelter options and the expansion of the current emergency shelter options. The homelessness work group uh, this afternoon emailed council a document summarizing some comments for the purpose of preparing you for this work session. So we want to let you know to look for that. My second topic concerns Nightingale Health Sanctuary. The rest stop has relocated to South Eugene and temporarily shifted to a car camp. Uh, I wanted to say many thanks to the NHS residents, the site managers, the steering committee for their flexibility, and to Good Sam and the neighborhood for receiving them. Um, they're in my neighborhood now, a uh, block and a half from my house. And to CSS for the use of their Conestogas and city staff for their assistance in the relocation effort. Given that Nightingale has found housing for 38 people, the program is a huge success, and they're a model rest stop. So we look forward to them returning to being a rest stop and finding a permanent home with the help of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, John Borofsky, followed by Ed Moy. Good evening, Mayor, Madam Mayor, and City Council. My name is John Borofsky, and I live in Ward 1. I'm a member of the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, and I'm here to support the substantial amendment to the action plan before you on your consent calendar. This is a rededication of funds. The city will be this is with this rededication of funds, the city will be in a position to help with the rehabilitation of a very important asset, Yapoa Terrace Apartments Complex. This is a 222 unit building in the heart of our city that affords our qualified seniors population to live without the stress of being rent burdened. People who are, people's rents are capped at 30% of their income and without the needed upgrades, the HUD grants that support this program would go away. So please be proud of the work you're doing, and thanks to the staff and their hard work for implementing the complicated compliance issues that go along with this kind of funding. Secondly, as a board member of the Fairmont neighborhood, I would like to speak to you about action item number four, the motion regarding allocation of staff resources for area planning. I passed out a memo from 2014 about the interim protection measures for the near university neighborhoods. In it, you will see that the neighborhoods have been waiting patiently for over three years to begin area planning. 
On top of that, many of the needed tools to address the missing middle housing needs are in fact prohibited in these neighborhoods. Strategies such as row houses, duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes, as well as secondary dwelling units are not allowed in these neighborhoods at this time. We are ready, willing, and able as soon as staff says go. So please keep us in the queue as stated in the Eugene, Envision Eugene Action Plan. You know, there was talk about neighborhoods being up and running. Well, we were, we were up and running three years ago and, and we're told to kind of put on the brakes. And so we're ready to go whenever the resources are available. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Moy, followed by Lee DeVoe. My name is Ed Moy, and I live in Betty Taylor's district. Over the past year and a half, my neighborhood and my home have been assaulted by the Swazi juggernaut. During that time, my wife and I have lived in constant fear of losing our home of 15 years. The council has supported our neighborhood's point of view on several occasions. After a well-publicized effort to gather input from all concerned parties, the council directed the planning department to work with the neighbors to create a refinement plan. The planners now claim that they have pressing commitments to other neighborhoods which must be suddenly honored. I can relate to neighborhoods wanting the planning department to do their job. I want them to follow council direction to implement the refinement plan for South Willamette. Over a thousand people signed a petition in support of this goal. My neighborhood has stepped up to do its end of the work, and yet the planning department is claiming it is incapable. I can't help but ask why the planners decided to spend five years secretly creating Swazi and a year and a half fighting to ignore the neighbors if they were already overcommitted. Why put forth South Willamette through something that they clearly don't want if there are neighborhoods that are already clamoring to develop just such a plan? South Willamette neighborhood stands ready and eager to do the heavy lifting involved in developing a refinement plan. As I stated before, a refinement plan that more than a thousand people have petitioned the city to finish. A plan that the city has formally directed the overstretched planning department to complete. In an effort to help out this hopelessly overburdened planning department, why doesn't the council empower the neighbors to proceed with developing a refinement plan without staff assistance? We are willing to help those poor overcommitted planners get out of the mess they created. It will save money, it will provide assistance to a hopelessly overburdened bureaucracy, and it will empower the neighbors to take their, to make their own decisions. I want my life back. I want my home back. I want my neighborhood back. I want my hope back. I finally want my government back. After all, the question of the day is, what does democracy look like? This is what democracy looks like, is the answer from South Willamette. Which side will you be on? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, Lee DeVoe followed by Sarah Pichoneri. Hi, uh, my name is Lee DeVille, I live in Ward 7. I'm speaking tonight as a community member of the Homelessness Work Group, a subcommittee of the Eugene Human Rights Commission. The following ideas were generated by members of the group in response to the emergency of homeless and unsheltered people living in our community and to contribute to the discussion that City Council will be having this week about a public shelter. In 2016, 1,451 homeless people were recorded in the annual Lane County point in time count. Of those, 934 were living unsheltered. Last winter, between November and February, over 800 people stayed each night in emergency winter shelter. Applications for Section 8 housing have been closed since 2015. While we strongly support Housing First, we believe that, there, that until there is enough affordable housing, we need to start with Shelter First and Day Respite. We advocate for an emergency shelter system, which includes the creation of a low barrier indoor shelter 
end an expansion of existing shelter and day respite options. The car camping program, uh, rest stop program, dust to dawn camping program, and tiny house village model have all been successful in improving people's lives by providing safety and security. If these programs are given financial and administrative support to expand, they would likely be able to accommodate the majority of people living unsheltered. With support, more providers could be recruited and projects could be flexible and creative in design. <coughs> we also advocate for an, expen an expansion of day respite centers. Some centers similar to the service station would provide facilities for showers and laundries. Other might simply be making space for hospitality. Expanding respite centers would alleviate some of the overload on the library, the downtown streets, and city parks. We believe that a vibrant community is one which provides opportunities for all its residents. We ask you to support this vision. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, we've sent you a packet of information regarding shelter and day respite, uh, and we ask that you review it before your Wednesday work session. Uh, we invite you to attend our meetings, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Pichonary, followed by Margie James. Hi, my name is Sarah Pichonary. I live in Ward 7. This is Maya down here. Uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking the council for opening up discussions on public shelter. Um, as the discussion proceeds, I want to remind council of the community groups who've dedicated uh, years on issues, who've worked for years on issues surrounding homelessness. Uh, such groups include, but are not limited to, the Human Rights Commission's Homelessness and Poverty Working Group, Occupy Medical, White Bird, Egan Warming Centers, Opportunity Village, Community Supported Shelters, Cahoots, and Nightingale Health Sanctuary, among others. The individuals within these organizations have dedicated countless hours on issues surrounding the unhoused. Please recognize the value of concepts and ideas that are tried and true on Ground Zero. Please invite them to the conversation and planning process in a real way. Let's move forward with this as a community with the best interests of those this shelter will, will serve in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Margie James, followed by Kathy Feely. Good evening. As always, I appreciate the time you all make for public comment. Uh, my name is Margie James, Ward 2, and I'm on the committee from Friendly Area Neighborhood that drafted and uh, submitted a process proposal for the South Willamette uh, Street Refinement Plan Enhanced Walkability and Accessibility District. Though I am disappointed that these discussions are moving away from the planning department's support for this refinement plan on South Willamette, I can support the change in priorities if there continues to be support by HRNI and other city departments as needed for capacity building within the South Willamette neighborhoods to continue forward movement with this refinement plan process, taking advantage of current momentum. Likewise, there needs to be support of of other neighborhoods desiring to begin or continue and actively engage in planning in their neighborhoods. I support council directive to planning department to attend to River Road Santa Clara refinement planning and I encourage council to support planning department attention to South University neighborhood who has been in had a temporary ruling for two years and it's time to actively m move to a plan that replaces um, that ruling. I feel like this tiered support with neighborhoods being at different places in the planning process should allow the planning department to better create predictable timelines for this part of their work. Communication and collaboration is a key to any success, and I hope that continues to be a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Feely, followed by Ian Curtis. Hi, my name is Kathy Feely, and I live in Whitaker. Um, congratulations, you've squeezed the balloon. The dogs are out of downtown. Now they're in Washington Jefferson Park. One of our neighbors was attacked walking through there this weekend with his animals. Not only did the dogs attack his dog, but three or four of the people who were hanging around not taking care of their dogs attacked him. So um, it, it's not okay. We told you this would happen. 
We had Chief Kearns at our WCC meeting the other day, and he proudly announced that four additional resources from the other beats have been moved to downtown. We asked him for specifics about what he was going to do to address Whitaker, and there are still no specifics. But you can be really specific about downtown, but not Whitaker, or you're squeezing the problem too. Um, the Eugene Marathon is coming, and I would imagine that the EPD will be very busy moving the campers off of the riverfront what for the marathon and then letting them go back afterwards. Um, Whitaker refinement plan, we have one, but the city ignores it. So message to the South Eugene neighbors, just because you have one doesn't mean it, what's in it is going to mean anything. Sedacking of social services is in the plan and you're still doing it in Whitaker. So, when you go to build your new shelter, do not put it in Whitaker. As a matter of fact, several of the members of that committee should be from Whitaker so that we can make sure that it addresses the 400 campers that are in Whitaker every night. Um, we, we need to take care of the issues that are addressing Whitaker. We need specifics. We need funding to help with the destabilization of the neighborhood. People are moving out. They are selling their houses to absentee landlords who don't take care of the properties. The properties get boarded up. Then the squatters move in. The graffiti artists move in. They become, they get taken over by a business or torn down. And we are losing homes. We are losing our neighborhood because of your lack of planning. So please take care of it. Give us a specific plan to address Whitaker. Um, we also have something on the um, agenda for funding this evening for your neighborhood matching grants. It's the Whitaker Health Survey. We are hoping you will fund that. Um, we are stacked between two raised freeways and the railroad tracks, and we need to find out what the issues are for health within our community. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ian Curtis, followed by Eliza Kaczynski. Hello, City Councilors, Mayor Venice. Um, I'm Ian Curtis from Southeast Eugene High School's EG350 Club, and I live in Ward 2. As you already know, last Saturday was Earth Day. I would imagine that a number of you attended the Science March in support of our fellow scientists and the valuable work that they do. If you don't already know, there's another march this Saturday, the People's Climate March. Um, at this march, local climate activists, as well as my peers and I, will be leading a march to protest climate denial and demand a return to the normal state of our planet's climate. The march will begin at noon at the EMU and proceed to a rally on the um, at the federal courthouse from 1 to 3. This spring, climate activists like me, but usually a little older, have been hard at work trying to get um, legislation through our local governments, in particular the Oregon State Legislature, um, the Senate Bill 557, which despite lots of hard work, expired last week. 557 was an important bill that would have greatly helped improve Oregon's environment with effective regulations and language that would give old work new meaning. Thankfully, in Eugene, the pressure on our local government hasn't been as critical, but it's still meaningful. Um, thankfully, in Eugene, wait, um, the Climate Recovery Ordinance and the Transportation System Plan have been very promising pieces of legislation, and a number of councillors are strongly supportive of our, our environmental um, legislation goals, which is very encouraging. Um, today, I'm here to ask um, you what you can do to help the Mackenzie River. The Lieberg Fish Hatchery was recently closed and will no longer be stocking hatchery trout, and I am I myself am very attached to the Mackenzie River as well as the Willamette National Forest, having spent countless days catching trout on the river and spending last summer working for the Youth Conservation Corps in, the, in Mackenzie Bridge. As this will definitely have an effect on the population of healthy fish in the river, as well as the economies of the towns of Lieberg, Vita, and Blue River, who have catered to fishermen for decades, I'm wondering what you can do to help our river. Our river. Whether it's raise enough money to open the hatchery or simply talk to people who can do something about this, I felt it was important to make an attempt to reach out and see what we can, um, and see what we can, uh, and see what can be done on a local level. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Eliza Kaczynski, followed by Jennifer Smith. Hello, my name is Eliza Kaczynski. I live in Ward One, and I'm a member of WeCan. 
I saw in the register guard that council has been struggling to ensure they don't hear the same comment over and over. So I'm going to ask now that everyone who's here to support housing choice in Eugene to please stand up. <laughs> Eugene is facing a critical housing shortage. Prices are rising for both renters and home buyers. Many of us are finding the terms of our leases are changing quickly, leaving us scrambling to find some place to live. Those of us who are able to buy and would like a smaller home in a walkable area are finding that those types of homes are in particularly short supply. Those of us who have the resources and desire to create homes for our neighbors are finding that our attempts to create compatible infill are being made so complex by codes, regulations, fees, and process that is next to impossible, and even more impossible to do so in a way that would be affordable for the majority of Eugenians. The purpose of the projects that came out of Envision Eugene was to determine how to balance our community's need for housing choice and affordability, our desire to enhance and create our neighborhoods, our need to do our part to address climate change, and our desire to promote, promote compact urban development and transportation choice. The pillars work together. Compact, walkable neighborhoods support transit and help reduce our reliance on single occupancy automobiles, which makes it more likely that we'll be able to shift our transportation mode share enough to meet our climate recovery goals. Providing increased access to existing walkable neighborhoods in the form of compatible housing can provide both economic opportunities and housing choice and affordability. Addressing housing affordability for all income levels also makes subsidized housing easier to create. However, since the pillars were created, the projects that have attempted to implement them have failed or stalled when they reached this council, primarily to appease those for whom the idea of protecting existing neighborhoods trumps all other concerns. This city removed the ability of 4,000 homeowners to create secondary dwelling units and turned discussions about how to achieve our goals into power struggles over process. On Wednesday, it was said that this council made a promise to the Neighbors Association Boards of South Willamette. But this council in the city has made a lot of promises. Almost every neighborhood has been promised a refinement plan. You made a commitment to value equity in this city to ensure that no neighborhood is forgotten. But a piecemeal approach to addressing the interconnected issues of housing choice, transportation options, walkability, economic opportunity, and climate change and energy resiliency in our city means that our children and our children's children will still be waiting for it to be their turn. Thank you, and Jennifer Smith will continue this comment. Thank you. Jennifer Smith, followed by Jim New. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Smith. I live in Ward 3, and I'm a member of WeCan. As a city, we've made a commitment to take serious steps to reduce our impact on climate. We've promised to implement actions to stop transportation deaths in the city, to protect our natural resources, and to examine the question of urban reserves. And we've promised each other that we would work to provide housing that is affordable to all income levels. Our city has finite resources. We don't have an endless pool of time and money. River Road has a limited time opportunity to use grant funds to supplement our city planning resources. Let's take advantage of that and pass the motion that Councillor Evans introduced. Back in October, when you passed the South Willamette Initiative motion, Councillor Brown promised a quick process that you could vote on and start in January. This promise hasn't materialized. Though the South Willamette process has stalled and its outcome seems murky, our citywide goals have not changed. We still need to honor the character of our neighborhoods, and we need to address, we need to take action to address the housing crisis that we are having now. I want to reaffirm that corridor planning makes the most sense if we want to make improvements to how our city functions in time for our children to benefit. Disjointed, piecemeal refinement planning isn't getting us closer to our goals. Everyone in this room comes at this concern from a different perspective. We live all over Eugene. Some of us are renters who struggle to keep up with rising rents. Some of us are trying to buy our first home or to downsize to one that meets our changing needs. Some of us are currently without any shelter at all. Some of us are landlords, property owners, architects, or builders who wish to help to provide housing for others. Some of us care most about being able to live in a walkable neighborhood or having the choice to bike or take transit to get around. We want to protect and repair our environment to provide economic security for ourselves and others and to make sure that everyone in our city, including our most vulnerable citizens, are able to have a roof over their heads. We are asking you, as our elected representatives, to help us create the Eugene we envisioned. 
You won't make all of us happy all the time. There are going to be hard decisions and hard choices. Please make them. We support solutions to our housing crisis. We support housing choice, and we're standing up for that value. Thank you. Thank you. Jim New, followed by Kelsey Weilbrenner. Mayor and Council, uh, my name is Jim New. I live in Ward 7. Um, I applaud the mayor, council, and the county commissioner's efforts to get the transportation system plan to an adoptable package. However, after last Monday night's transportation system plan <coughs> meeting and comments by the county commissioners, I have concerns with the approval process of the TSP. It was clear not all elements, and specifically the CRO, the Climate Recovery Ordinance, will be considered before the TSP goes before a vote which if passed will make it most difficult for the city to meet 50% community-wide reduction of fossil fuels by 2030 and a reduction in the greenhouse gases of 7.6% per year. Last Monday, three, council, three county commissioners stated their unfamiliarity with the contents of the CRO, which signifies two important points. One, they will be making an uninformed decision in passing the TSP because they are not considering the criteria that determines a successful TSP to the year 2030. And two, this more than illustrates a failure to educate the public that the city is required to fulfill the goals of the CRO. If the decision makers of the future of county and city transportation policy are uninformed of the aspects of what they are voting to approve, how is the public going to voluntary, voluntarily adjust their transit habits to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in daily routine? Two dozen residents of the North Delta Highway that had concerns about development and transit should have known where and how we build housing and roadways is based on the climate recovery goals. I hope the city councilors have offered to provide the county commissioners with a copy of the CRO so they understand the factors involved before they vote to approve the TSP. It appears the county commissioners and the constituents they represent should understand that the Eugene has an adopted goal to reduce community-wide use of fossil fuels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kelsey Walbrenner, followed by Bob Weiss. <clears throat> Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, Ma Mayor Venice and Councilors. Um, my name is Kelsey Weilbrenner. I am the administrator of Yapoa Terrace Retirement Apartments in downtown Eugene, Ward 7. I'm here tonight to speak in support of the proposed budget adjustments to reallocate additional monies to the Housing Rehabilitation Fund. Yapoa is a HUD 202 senior only housing project with 222 units. I experience firsthand every day the increase in demand for affordable housing such as Yapoa. Um, preserving what we have already in this community is really important. In the three years I have worked at Yapoa, I have watched our wait go from 30 to 60 days. It's now nine months at, at shortest. We're extremely grateful for funds that have already been committed um, to help preserve our building of over 200 rent subsidies. Without those commitments, those rent subsidies would go away. So I encourage you all to consider supporting the proposed budget adjustments so more affordable housing projects like Yapoa can get the critical building system updates they need to continue to be a safe, decent, sanitary place to live here in Eugene. So uh, here with me tonight is Res President Bob Weiss, who will tell you why Yapoa Terrace and affordable housing is so important to the Eugene community. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Weiss, followed by Jonathan, oh, John Belcher. Um, I'm Bob Weiss. I'm from Ward 7, Sarrett's Ward. And I'd like to uh, greet you, Madam Mayor, Menace, and to basically just say thank you. I haven't got any bells, whistles, nuts, bolts, anything here. What I, what I do is I'd like to report to you the emotional impact of the work that you've done at Yapoa. Um, prior to um, 
the work that you have done, there was an awful lot of fear going through our residents that we're going to lose health, health flood status. And that, that frightens people my age. Uh, it just removes the, the chance of having a home, you know, and it was a very real problem and a complex one because there's you, there's the state, there's private stuff going on, and everybody has done a terrific job in promoting that, and we want to thank you. Um, as I uh, walk around at Yapoa, the idea of safety is very strong with older people, and there's, they all say, we feel safe. They've really worked for us. This, we feel safe. And if you would like that sort of reaction from other elderly people and people who need affordable housing, I'd like to join with Kelsey on uh, the idea of re uh, reallocating funds to the re re Rehabilitation Housing Fund, because if it's working for us, and just the short time that we've been working with this, it will work for other people for the same reasons. Now, I've been in Yapoa for 15 years, and I've watched as it's, in spite of the excellent staff that we have, it keeps needing repair and keeps needing repair, as I do. As I notice, as I get older, I keep needing more and more repair. So I want to thank you again, not only for myself, but for the residents of your poll, doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. John Belcher, followed by Claire Strawn. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am John Belcher, and I live in Ward 7. I'm the co-chair of the River Road Community Organization and a member of the joint ARCO-SACO script committee. Those, these um, involvements inform my comments, but I'm speaking my own behalf. I would like to speak specifically about the land use policy issues you will discuss as you consider the motion made by Councillor Evans and seconded by Councillor Surratt last Wednesday and tabled to tonight's meeting. Whatever the outcome of any votes, I encourage you to continue your commitment to River Road Santa Clara's area plan. We are already working with the Eugene planning staff to develop a project initiation letter to define the roles of city, county, and our neighborhood associations and the outcomes of our work. We will be meeting in two days to outline our public involvement process. In other words, we are well on our way. Please ensure that we can continue to move forward. Last Wednesday, one of you suggested that we should concurrently discuss how to move forward the discussion of annexation of county jurisdiction properties because, in his words, without annexation, the area plan won't apply to the unincorporated areas of River Road and Santa Clara. This is incorrect for at least three reasons. Number one, there is an IJ between city and county that commits the county to ratify city land use policies for unincorporated areas within the urban growth boundary. Number two, in order for anyone to develop a property, that owner has to first annex into the city and therefore become subject to city policies. Number three, our project initiation letter includes language that states, River Road Santa Clara neighborhood plan encompassing all areas within both committees will be adopted as a refinement to the metro plan and to the local comprehensive. <laughs> if you need further confirmation, please talk to staff and they'll tell you their opinion. That said, we do need to discuss options for an voluntary annexation once the area plan is complete. Developing the area plan will facilitate that process by demonstrating a new positive relationship between River Road and Santa Clara residents in the city of Eugene, as well as identifying instances where annexation could solve challenges in our area. Once those have occurred, the annexation process to follow will be far more informed and fruitful. Thank you for considering my input and all the hard work you do for the community. I look forward to the day when we have completed our area plan and are before you asking you to adopt it as a latest refinement plan to the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Claire Strawn, followed by Cindy Allen. Thank you for having this forum. My name is Claire Strawn, and I own a home um, on Horn Lane in the River Road neighborhood. I've been actively involved in the neighborhood for the past five years, and I'm really proud that our citizen civic involvement, innovative thinking, creative problem solving that we have amongst our neighbors. We have lots of opportunities in our area to be a showcase for best practices of sustainable design, and people are really enthused about this idea. 
Um, we have been ready to go for several years now. We've been working on it for a long time. In the meantime, there's aggressive infield development that's moving forward, big plans for transportation development, a crying need for economic development, and affordable housing. We want to work proactively with the city to create a welcoming, affordable, walkable, multi-use neighborhood. In my experience, policy can support and facilitate community empowerment by creating space for innovation and exploration of possible solutions for our common well-being. It can also be obstructionist by ruling out possibilities like affordable accessory dwellings and imposing development costs that are out of range for the community. These are real and urgent issues for our neighborhood. My home is not part of the city and I realize that annexation is contentious. I feel I would be better able to have an informed conversation about annexation if the area plan was in place. If we're able to start our plan area planning process, we can address these de development issues in a systematic, well-designed way rather than hodgepodge. So I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy Allen, followed by Carlene Riley. Cindy Allen, South Eugene. I'm speaking about refinement plans. When Eugene's largest property manager was indicted, we learned that he managed over 500 properties and that the owners came from throughout the United States and all over the world. Eugene is not alone in this. The corporate interest and the very wealthy are actively trying to buy the tangible assets of properties and land. Multi-story housing units and apartment complexes are especially lucrative. A friend who lives in the Silicon Valley rented in a complex for many years. Recently it was sold and the rent was almost doubled. Those in the complex tried to challenge the increase but were not successful. When you rent, there is no equity. At the Eugene meeting on transportation, the head of the Home Builders Association said that much of the reasonably priced single family housing in the university area was lost when the many multi-unit housing projects were built. And now Eugene is facing a critical shortage of reasonably priced houses. It's what the neighbors of South Willamette said would also happen in their area, adding even more to the shortage of reasonably priced housing. Single family homes have food gardens and solar access. The multi-story housing projects are usually investor owned. The failed South Willamette area zoning, Swazi, had over 83 pages of very complicated rezoning changes that were of much concern to neighbors after an analysis was done of the legalese. No one minds reasonable development, but development with balance and clarity is very important. A particular concern is the infrastructure of the area. Is the development compatible with the existing conditions of the road? and does it comply with safety standards? I feel particularly sorry for the people who live in the Oakley Lane area. They had to hire an attorney, file a lawsuit, and spend thousands of dollars on fees. There are also all the people who put up money for the proposed new development. Hopefully, neighborhood refinement plans will help to prevent such a tangled situation from ever happening again. Pillar five of it of Envision Eugene is protect, repair, and enhance neighborhood li livability. Whatever area of the city, oh, excuse me, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Carlene Riley, followed by Carol Schurer. I'm Carlene Riley, 395 Marion Lane, and uh, I live in Claire's Ward, Ward 7, I believe. 
Greetings, Mayor Vinnes and all you Eugene City Councilors. It's nice to be here again before you on River Road Santa Clara issues. The River Road Santa Clara neighbor, neighborhoods are eager to problem solve in a collaborative manner on a neighborhood plan that culminates in a document with legal standing. And we appreciate the city planning staff. They have been excellent to work with. We have been working diligently for seven years to determine our neighbors' priorities, identify their problems, listen to their solutions, and craft strategies to address their needs. We hired our own consultant to guide our process. We want to engage in an efficient and thorough planning process. We appreciate and will make good use of city planning resources, expertise, and funds. We'll utilize ideas generated by other neighborhoods, plan for affordable middle, missing middle housing, and seek to improve public transit, promote economic development, and maintain green spaces. We trust planning staff will make a proper assessment of where to assign city staff and funds to be the most productive. Will Councillor Greg Evans' motion make any change in the focus of planning staff? Unless some miraculous influx of funds and staff arrive to work on planning projects, the same neighborhoods will be standing in the same lines waiting for planning resources. Our neighbors are very interested in maintaining and building a sense of community as we work toward our long-term goals to address our problems. We want to be a welcoming community, embracing newcomers as they make homes among us. One neighbor wrote to me this week, if we do it right, we can keep our smallness and have density. Our neighbors are creative thoughtful and intelligent. They want to take pride in their neighborhood, feel secure, have gathering places to facilitate frequent interactions and develop a sense of trust and take care of one another in cases of emergency. We hope the direction begun seven years ago by Envision Eugene for River Road and Santa Clara will continue with support for our planning efforts in a problem-solving collaborative process. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Carol Scherer, <coughs> followed by Beverly Barr. Hi, I'm Carol Scherer. I'm at Chris Pryor's ward. Um, Jim New spoke very wisely and purposely, purposefully about the um, climate recovery ordinance and I strongly support his message and I hope that you will give it strong consideration. I can add nothing further beyond what he was able to tell you other than I feel that you are strongly the first line of protection that the people have regarding protecting our lives and our environment and that the uh, council uh, that the commission is the next line of protection. And unfortunately, the national level is pretty destructive, taking away tools. And uh, so we need to rely strongly on what is happening right here at our local communities. And I think that um, the local communities across the nation are going to be stepping up. Uh, hopefully, and that will also allow the state governments to also feel more empowered. And so I think we're going to have to stand strong against the forces that are working against um, trying to make a difference as far as what climate change is going to do in our lives. Um, so I thank you very much for standing up, and I thank you for standing up for science. Uh, regarding the climate recovery ordinance, we must have substance in it as a result of this being very important that we deal with it locally. The greenhouse gases must be measured. The Beltline expansion project and other projects that will be coming on need to have greenhouse gas assessment. 
In a little over 10 years, our community-wide use of fossil fuels should be reduced by 50%. So please work with the county. Our next line of protection from bad national leadership and address greenhouse gases and adhere to the climate recovery <coughs> ordinance goals. The people need this protection. Our planet needs the protection. You are our first line. So thank you for what you do. Um, I am thinking about sometimes how issues just keep coming so fast in such a variety of ways that this is historical. And I think about the um, TV segment with Lucy and Ethel and the chocolate on the conveyor belt. <laughs> and as those pieces keep coming, they're all important and they're also not chocolate. Um, some pieces are more important than others. Some are messier than others. And I think you should not lose sight of probably the biggest, the messiest piece, which is the climate. So please give strong consideration to what you can do to assess the greenhouse gases. Thank you. Beverly Barr, followed by Pamela Miller. Hi, Councilors, thanks for this opportunity to speak to you. I'm here to address the motion put forward by uh, Councilor Evans to direct the planning department to the River Road Santa Clara area for the development of a neighborhood plan. The last plan crafted for our area is over 30 years old. It's woefully out of date. It doesn't reflect Eugene, envision Eugene and doesn't address the unique and historic character of our neighborhoods. Subsequent, subsequent, subsequently, our formerly rural neighborhoods Hoods have been urbanizing without adequate planning, vision, input from the residents, or enforceable provisions. To help address these concerns, I've been a member of the script group for over seven years, and we have been in a continuous process of education and outreach with our neighbors, and have cataloged vast amounts of information and ideas about our needs and our solutions. Therefore, we've already achieved a significant start on the planning process. The plan we create will apply to all of the neighborhoods and all those in the neighborhoods. In working on the plan, we expect to bring together the concerns of incorporated and un unincorporated residents and businesses. We're looking forward to solutions to many concerns. Public safety is one of our major concerns and the inefficient hodgepodge, there's that word again, of unincorporated versus incorporated service delivery is another. Over these seven plus years, Script has been in continuous process with the city planning department and with city managers and executives. And we have consulted with the planning commission. We're very grateful for all the expertise and the encouragement that we've received building these mutually beneficial working relationships once again illustrates how, what the running start we already have on the planning process. Now we have a sense of urgency. Over the years, we received several projected start dates for the beginning of our neighborhood planning process. Some of those went, dates have gone by as long as five years ago. So we're still waiting and we're concerned now about the shelf life of some of the information that we've gathered and then that we're ready to go forward with. And we've also concerned about the loss of momentum if we are challenged with further delays. In approving this motion, it's not our intention to be in competition with any of the other neighborhoods. We've been waiting on our turn for many years. Now we're ready to go and with your approval, we shall proceed and may our success light the way for others. Thanks again for your attention, and if you need any further information or have questions, I'm in touch. Thank you. Oh, I'm Beverly Barr, and I live in Betty, on Betty Lane. In Thank you. And next up, Pamela Miller, followed by Bill Aspigren. Pamela Miller from Ward 3. Thank you. I speak tonight in support of allocation of planning resources for neighborhood-specific implementation of Envision Eugene. Neighborhoods have been engaged in this process for a long time. 
Approximately 10 years ago, the infill, infill compatibility standards task group arose, which was a community initiated working group that included neighborhood representatives, architects, developers, and planners. The group explored questions around facilitating infill in a manner that would mitigate impacts upon livability. This preliminary work preceded and contributed materially to the community resource group, the city's first formal effort to implement the process which has come to be known as Envision Eugene. It was this group, which was also comprised of a broad range of community stakeholders, that developed the famous pillars upon which Envision Eugene was built. Since then, we have been asked to wait, and wait, and wait, while city planning resources were directed towards UGB and other thorny issues which delayed the adoption of Envision Eugene. Meanwhile, development has been booming and moves forward without regard to the overarching vision of its pillars. It is high time for the city to honor the promises it made regarding resource allocation to neighborhood planning. Many neighborhoods are ready to engage where the rubber hits the road. The implementation of Envision Eugene goals through development of code, design standards, and other legally binding measures, such as refinement plans, which will allow growth within our diverse neighborhoods in a way which preserves livability and enhances the desirability of our city as a place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Aspergren, followed by Carolyn Jacobs. Good evening. I'm uh, Bill Aspergren. I uh, live in Ward 3, Alan Zelenka's Ward. And I'd like to talk about the motion you will vote on later tonight concerning neighborhood planning. Uh, yesterday, I sent an email with an attached proposal for guiding uh, neighborhood planning, which is what I'm routed around here. <laughs> the proposal was endorsed by a cross-section of neighborhood leaders and is meant to help all neighborhoods in planning efforts. I believe a new motion will be made tonight to use this planning proposal moving forward. Personally, I fully endorse adding the Highway 99 Bethel Corridor to the priority areas needing planning assistance. I do not support uh, switching or refocusing current and committed planning efforts for Highway 99 Bethel or any other area. <clears throat> With assistance from community members, I believe the various neighborhoods, neighborhood plans can proceed simultaneously. <clears throat> From the perspective of the university area, we are ready and have been ready uh, to move ahead with area plans. Several years ago, uh, we wanted to initiate a planning effort uh, for the university area, but we're told resources were not available, which is understandable. Uh, we were asked to wait until Envision Eugene was locally approved which we're still waiting for, okay? Uh, people in the neighborhood felt we needed something sooner. Uh, we worked with staff to craft neighborhood-specific provisions that would allow for growth, yet be compatible with neighborhood characteristics. Those changes were, were approved and became effective in 2014. Uh, a couple of previous speakers here implied that SDUs or prohibited or couldn't be built anymore, that's a misconception. Um, and in our one area, in all our one areas within the city, you can build an SDU as long as your lot is uh, of sufficient size. <laughs> so, you know, we could go into details, but I don't think I have time. <laughs> we are ready to move ahead with the university area people. Uh, ahead using the 20, 2014 provisions as a starting point, for more inclusive plans that will create design standards and mitigate the impact of being near the university. Um, it's great to see four areas of Eugene that want to be in front of the curve and plan for growth before it happens. Um, please encourage this enthusiasm by supporting the proposal for guiding uh, neighborhood planning. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Carolyn Jacobs next, followed by Michael Kerrigan. Oh, sorry, Carolyn Jacobs, Ward 3. 
mayor, city councilors. A small number of community members were was following last Wednesday's city council work session. We were alarmed, to say the least, that with the motion that Councillor Evans made that would effectively cause the city to walk away from some of its previous planning commitments. Some of us are already engaged in planning processes and have developed working relationships with planning staff. Others of us are still waiting patiently for our time to come. With only a few days to respond, we attempted to put together a proposal which provides you with a pathway to honor all your commitments. It really does nothing more and nothing less. Walking away from both long-term and recent commitments would obviously be a terrible mistake if for no other reason it would send the message that council is not to be trusted and it would appear that at any time you might just decide to walk away from something that people have worked long and hard on. So the proposal that grew in response to our alarm at the thought of losing either support for work we're currently involved in or our dreams of future projects simply recommends that you state clearly your intention to keep out front and visible your Envision Eugene pillar promises. And secondly, that you reaffirm the importance of the Neighborhood Organization Recognition Policy, also known as NORP, which you approved with Resolution 3746. Section two of that policy opens the door for a wide range of possibilities involving various amounts of resources and time for both planning staff and neighborhood organizations. The opportunities inherent in this policy are numerous, though clearly delving into the details of the many options would have to be the subject of yet another meeting. So when all is said and done, the proposal that we came up with and brought to you merely brings together the words of pledges and promises you have made before over many years. Honestly, we've come up with nothing really new and nothing really original. We were just hoping to shine a light on the way forward, a way for you to honor commitments that have already been made and a way that allows all neighborhoods to get involved from here forward. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Kerrigan, followed by Wayne Martin. Um, my name is Michael Kerrigan. I live in Ward 7. Um, I'm here today rep representing Community Alliance of, of Lane County. I'm also on the steering committee of the Nightingale Health San Sanctuary and a part of the, uh, uh, the homeless uh, work group as part of the, of the Human Rights Commission. I wanted to thank, first of all, city staff, the hard work <laughs> finding a new site for the uh, Nightingale Health Sanctuary in, in, in Southeast. Yes, it's only a, a site for six folks instead of 20, but it's a great location with uh, Conestoga huts supplied by community supported uh, uh, shelter. The neighborhood gave us a total welcome back, you know, welcome that. It was yes in our backyard, and it feels, feels really good. But also bodes well for the establishment of uh, car camping and re rest stops throughout the rest of the city. So even though it's only six people, it's a real opportunity to show the community that yes, rest stops work, the car camping works. It can add to the livability of neighborhoods throughout our city. We also strongly support the establishment of a, a home homeless shelter. But at the uh, work session on Wednesday, we really are hoping that city staff to, to really push for more rest stops, the car camping, the Don Don the, the dust program, because these programs work. They are cost-effective alternatives that can help provide shelter for a good number of people right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wayne Martin next, followed by Ro Pastor Roy Lee Samuels. I need to be um, in contact with this device in front of me that tells me how much time I have left. I'm Wayne Martin, and I live in Ward 4, and I thank you all for spending your time tonight listening to your constituents and considering what we have to say. I'm a member of the Board of Nightingale Health Sanctuary, as is Michael. This 
sanctuary opened up not long after the closing of the Whoville encampment at Broadway and Hilliard three years ago this month. We began on the Lane County Behavioral Health Grounds. For the past eight months, we've been operating a rest stop for 15 residents on the property across the street from the Eugene Mission, as you know. At the end of this week, as Michael said, we will be moving to a reduced occupancy situation at 34th and Hilliard and beginning with six residents as part of St. Vincent de Paul's overnight camping program. We're grateful for St. Vincent de Paul now and for Keith Heath, who has been just invaluable to this program over the years. We're excited to begin our relationship with the folks of Southeast Eugene. Now I'd like to take a few remaining moments to acknowledge a number of people and partners. I'll begin with City Manager John Reese and his staff, especially Reagan Watches and Mia Carriaga. Thank you for spending so much time looking for appropriate locations and sticking with us and administering. I'd like to thank Kristen Fay and Eric DeBoer for helping us procure six of their signature Conestogas. They all will add touch to a great touch to the experience of forming this community. I'd like to offer a big thank you to the Eugene Mission. What a rewarding and organic experience it's been. Special thanks to Jack Tripp, the executive director, to Dana Corey, the senior director of operations, Bill Warner, the facilities managers, and the great kitchen staff they have there. I want to give appreciation to my fellow board members. We're a working board. We don't have deep pockets. And I'm especially thankful for Nathan and Tracy. Without their gifted and sensitive leadership, we could not have placed all the people we did in stable housing. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Next up, Pastor Roy Lee Samuels, followed by Foster Robinson. Good evening to the uh, mayor and the councilmen. And thank you for putting on the ballot concerning the uh, vandalism of the Jewish synagogue in Eugene. I believe this involved just about everyone in the Eugene area because we worship somewhere. And I would just like to uh, Thank you again for this opportunity. And my main concern is this here. I've lived in Eugene from a youth, and I followed how Eugene has uh, addressed problems. And I'm listening tonight that problems have not been addressed well, promises had been shortcoming, but even with all of that, I just hope that uh, the commission, the mayor would address the problem of the vandalism uh, because it's in your hands, so to speak, in the law enforcement to protect the innocent and to uh, punish the one who are lawless. And this isn't a uh, new problem in our country, but it's a problem that is seen to turn over from the cross burnings, destroying uh, churches, and I just ask that uh, the mayor, city councilman, 
will begin to uh, act on these issues. There are certain issues that we will act on, but then there's other issues that seem like we kind of move slow. And I just would ask us to uh, take care of the problem as they come up, that we can, all the worshipers can have a place to worship in safety and without fear of being destroyed. I have a church out on 55, 59 Edna Way, and and to hear as a synagogue. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Foster Robinson, followed by Pam Woodell. Mayor, members of the City Council, my name is Foster Robinson. I live at 2105 Roland Way here in Eugene. I've lived there since 1976. Our street, I've got pictures here for you to look at, is coming totally unraveled. It's broke up everywhere. Uh, we have 18 houses on that street. There's over $70,000 a year paid in property taxes on that street, combining all 18 houses together. And we need our road fixed. Now, I do want to give credit uh, to the city public works. When we have major chuck holes, they do come out on a short notice and put some coal patch in them. But if you look at the pictures, our street is breaking up. I have worked around asphalt for over 50 years. And when asphalt starts breaking up, that means the water gets underneath it. And we've got this notice for night for 2018, and in all respect to the existing council, we've had notices like this before, and nothing has happened. Our street, in my opinion, will not live through another winter. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. Pam Woodall, followed by Christine Sunt. My I'm Pam Waddell, and I'm a member of the FAN Board and a participant um, on the Committee to Advance the South Willamette Refinement Plan, and I live in uh, Betty Taylor's ward. Um, I sat through the last Wednesday's uh, City Council work session, and it occurred to me um, that all the proposed area planning projects in their various stages of development should be able to move forward. I am concerned that this debate around Councillor Evans' motion risks uh, pitting neighbors, neighborhoods against one another, and I believe the neighborhood associations have the ability and the desire to cooperate with one another so that appropriate staff and energy is placed when and where most needed. I understand the needs and efforts of the other neighborhoods, River Road, uh, South University, and all that, and I'm personally fine with South Willamette to work with HRNI instead of the planners at this time. It's appropriate. Uh, it is my hope that whatever policy you adopt um, tonight will sharpen our empathy and not our elbows. Um, I also believe from my experience meeting with the planning staff that we need for them to develop an improved set of tools, such as a neighborhood planning kit booklet, um, such as Lake Oswego has, um, so that they can do a better job of assisting neighborhood planning committees to help themselves and free up some of their staff time. Um, do city councilors have an adequate understanding of the actual capacity of our planning department? Um, at the 419 work session, Robin Hostick made the comment, comment that planners' time was limited until the completion of the urban growth boundary. There was no mention of when this would be. When and how much time would be freed up when that's done? Is our backlog of projects typical for a city our size? Can we be more efficient? Do we need more staff? With better organizing tools, could citizens get a faster start with their planning projects, thus requiring less staff time? South Willamette Refinement Plan Group lost some valuable time trying to lay the foundation to move forward from being an ad hoc pre-planning group to then recruit and authorize a representative planning team. However, finding the foothold to do this was needlessly elusive. 
Um, such difficulty does not have to be a huge obstacle if it is recognized and evaluated as a learning opportunity, and we work constructively to make it better. Um, we've been waiting since uh, February 27th, for instance, for a response from uh, the planners to a charter proposal that we submitted, believing that that's what we needed in, in order to go forward. So it's been two months and we haven't heard back. Uh, to abandon or penalize South Willamette at this, for this slow start is not fair. The city needs to take some responsibility as well. It has been a learning process for both. Anyway, um, I gladly co-signed the proposal that uh, uh, Bill gave to you guys too. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Christine Sunt, followed by Benjamin Brubaker. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for hearing us. I'm Christine Sunt, and I'm in Ward 2, Betty Taylor's Ward. I have two points. It's not us versus them in neighborhood planning. Rather, it's we're all in this together. and. Citywide zoning fixes could benefit all. The threat of 10-story buildings along the Willamette Street corridor was a scare tactic used in the proposed forced rezoning through the South Willamette Special Area Zone. This plan promised to protect us from commercial assaults currently permitted under C2, Community Commercial Zoning. But just recently, I was told by Mayor Venice that regardless of Swazi, a 10-story building wouldn't happen in this area because it's not a lucrative investment for a developer. So was SWSAZ a vacant promise? With or without the failed plan, we are still vulnerable to high-rise apartments across our fences, sprawling single-story storefronts, structures built to the sidewalk's edge, and but ugly buildings that defy the neighborhood's character. That's what refinement plans could and should address and why I trust Eugene citizens eager to protect and preserve neighborhood character and livability through community-led planning projects. C2 is a zoning disaster all over the city. Is it time to repeal and replace? It might be okay to site and build a tall structure in a vacant or underused industrial area where no residences are impacted. But if this happens in a dense residential neighborhood, then it simply doesn't belong there and it shouldn't be allowed. Can the city fix this problem once and for all? C2 and mixed use are often used to solve density, but why not promote more creative options instead? Sensible infill and missing middle housing can achieve integrated transitional density citywide. Both new and existing neighborhoods could then be protected and preserved from overbuilt assaults while adding desirable new housing. Sadly, the city shrugs off legal roadblocks and high fees that deter local individuals from adding these smaller integrated and varied structures while granting incentives and waivers to outside developers and investors to create density. City leaders, please fix these broken bits. It isn't fair and it's not the way to make Eugene a livable city today or in the future. Once these fixes are in place, refinement plans can do what they do best, refine. Thank you. Thank you. Benjamin Brubaker, followed by Vic Harriton. Hi, my name is Ben Brubaker. I live in Emily Simples District, and I appreciate a moment to be able to speak to you all. In particular, I would like to talk a little bit just about the emergency shelter um, and some of the needs that we see, that, that I see as a administrator at Whitebird Clinic. I'm actually one of the administrative coordinators trying to fill Chuck's big shoes. Um, additionally, I work as a crisis worker on the CAHOOTS team. Um, from the level of the street, I have seen a huge amount of success with community-supported shelters and some of the other rest stop projects. 
Um, we have done a lot of work partnering with community supported shelters to provide respite housing, um, specifically emergency housing uh, that was lost when we uh, closed down the Royal Avenue shelter locally. And we've been able to replace modestly some of that through some partnerships with community supported shelters. Um, they actually allow us to have a hut on their property that we can utilize for short term stays to try to catch people coming out of the hospital or um, who find themselves suddenly homeless. Um, additionally, I would just ask that we continue to build on the success of these programs locally and maybe even provide funding for some of the more successful projects. Um, these are some of the best housing uh, emergency shelter kind of options that I've seen the city push forward and I hope that we'll continue to expand this project. I also wanted to note that Multnomah County recently had a $300,000 project for tiny homes um, where they actually went out to the citizens and said, uh, let us build a, a tiny house in your backyard. If you manage it as a landlord for homeless families for five years, then you can have the structure um, and you don't have to pay the construction costs. If you decide that you have to go back on that, then you owe us the cost of the construction costs. Uh, within a week, they had 600 people step up, property owners saying that they'd be willing to place that kind of tiny home in their backyard yard. It's a really innovative project and I'm kind of embarrassed that Wiper didn't think of it first. Um, additionally, there's an overwhelming need for emergency shelter for those suffering from substance abuse and co-occurring mental health issues. Um, wet shelter, things like that are clearly needed in our community. Uh, Cahoots witnesses many who are unable to advance or even begin treatment and stabilization due to this critical need. Um, even those that do qualify for ex the sole existing shelter in town um, often find that they cannot access that when, when that is totally full and, and we're unable to find a placement for them. And again, that's where some of these other things we've been able to partner with community supported shelters to do um, have helped us to at least create some stopgap measures to catch folks like that. Um, Meanwhile, we know that housing first and shelter options um, have time and again saved community money. Uh, ER, law enforcement, um, you know, EMS savings that immediately saves our, our community and the community partners that are providing services money by having something as simple as a place where they can be. Additionally, we see a lot of folks who are really in critical need of services um, that get looped into various committees and, and Thank you for your time. Thank you. Vic Harriton, followed by Carrie, no last name. Good evening. Uh, my name is Vic Harriton. I'm in Ward 2, Betty Taylor's Ward. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to speak. Um, I had put down in my card that I'm speaking for Sheena. Uh, the board does mimic, or what do we call it, the, you know, my opinions or vice versa on this. So, but I'm going to do it as myself, so there's no conflict. Um, I want to re respectfully, uh, Councilor Evans, I do understand your motion. I um, am hoping that I did hear towards the end of the meeting that there was some push to go allow the friendly area neighbors to continue on their process. That there's so much energy that's been behind this to get to this point. And I didn't realize, I thought it was just Sheena that didn't have uh, information from planning for two months. So the fact that friendly didn't have that for two months, that was wrong. Um, that needs to be corrected because it needs to be much better communication. Um, River Road, Santa Clara, Bethel, uh, others that I've heard from that meeting, I think, yeah, let's go forward with them. But we don't have to have 100% of a staff's time to do that. We can do have uh, oversight. L the template for a refinement plan is there. Let the neighborhoods take control. Not everything has to be driven by planning team, let the neighbors take control of what they want to do in their neighborhood. Let the, you know, that's that's really the best way to make everybody happy. The idea with the C2s not making 10 stories, <coughs> I mean, if that wasn't the case, you probably wouldn't have had half the problems that you came up with with South Willamette, 10 stories along that property. Now, transportation plans uh, that have to go along with this, 
cars are not evil. I can't believe I actually have to say this. You know, I don't care if it's horse and buggy. Cars are not evil. Transportation is not evil. You need to get your car, your your plywood from point A to point B. I mean, I'm not going to take a bicycle to Jerry's and bring it up Crest Drive. I'm not even going to go down Crest Drive. I wouldn't stop in time. Um, what we need to do is make sure the transportation, the roads can handle. The bicyclists need to be safe. Automobiles are... You know, people come out. If you have congestion, I've lived in New York, I lived in Arizona, I lived in Dallas, I lived in Denver, I, uh, Austin for 30 years. It's everywhere I've been, people say, oh, well, it's not going to happen here, except well, New York was that one. But um, people will be aggressive when it comes to driving. You just go to um, Costco on a on a rainy day and see how people go for parking spots. Uh, it's going to be ugly, and I'm afraid that people are going to make quick moves and bicycles are going to be in their path. Um, the, oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie is next up, followed by Sue Sierra Lupe. Good evening. My name is Carrie, and I live in Western Eugene. <clears throat> Tonight, I'm here to speak about an uncomfortable topic in today's world, homelessness. It's not black and white. It's perceived as a gray area in society that has gone unnoticed by many and is understood by few. But to me, it's a colorful <coughs> spectrum and is not always easily defined. But what some of you may not know is being homeless can mean different things to different walks of life. It's not always a person who is unemployed looking for a handout. It's not always in the shape of an addict or a thief. And it's not always a person holding a sign on a corner. Sometimes it's your cashier, your waitress, or even students you may pass in the hall. Sometimes it's sleeping in your car until you can afford a hotel because there's no shelter with hope you don't get a ticket just for existing. <clears throat> Other times, it's drinking coffee all night to stay awake at a restaurant so you have somewhere safe to be, or even walking around aimlessly until dawn, trying to stay warm and dry, but most of all, alive. Besides the increasing amount of people living on the streets, there are more families of all types being forced to living in motels, buying trailers, or camping illegally because affordable housing is limited and rent has skyrocketed at many places. How American is it to turn away our own people, let alone anyone in need? Why are we so focused on criminalizing people just for existing? I'm tired of being silent, and I want to be a voice for all of those who have been or are homeless in any form, and for those who can't speak up from fear, including myself. We need public shelter for all, and now more than ever, we need to spread love. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Sierra Lupe. Followed by Kathy Jaworski. My name is Sue Sierra Lupe and I live in Ward 1. I have been living in Ward 1 for 30 years and I have watched the population of Eugene expand as the population of the world has expanded. And naturally, just going by the numbers, as there are more humans in the world, we need more places to put them. It is not a big surprise to me that we have a problem right now in downtown where you've been bringing more, working really hard as a body to bring more people downtown as shoppers or as businesses. but. When you bring more people downtown, um, people that are made of fluids and solids, yeah, think about that for a second, they need a place to put those lovely fluids and solids when they're done with it. Now, I have gross stories because I do work in the medical community, but as a personal favor to you all, what I will do is not tell those stories. When you have a large population in a small place and continue to add more and more and more people, you run into a problem with those fluids and solids. In England, for example, they're having problems with the masonry because they reduce their public bathrooms by 20%. That uric acid is breaking away their masonry from those beautiful old buildings. We have buildings here too. You have closed down the public bathrooms. We have standing, plumbed public bathrooms. They are not accessible anymore. What was the reason for closing them down? Because they were difficult to clean. Well, bathrooms 
are messy because people bring their messes to them. You have to clean them. I've been trying to tell my teenager, boy, this very thing for a long time. You don't tell the teenage boy now he can't use the bathroom. That means the yard will be a problem. That's what we've got going here. We need more bathrooms. You guys have already, as a body, decided that there needs to be more money to public parks and recreation. You've already given them that money. So let's stop this public health problem. Let's let's stop some of these attitude problems that people have. Well, well, the homeless are messy. Well, give them a place to put the mess. You know, people go to the bathroom eight times a day. That's a lot of times. If you want to bring more people down here, give them a place to put those eight little visits. I beg you, or you will be needing people like me in very uncomfortable, dangerous medical positions. I don't want to do that work, but I'm starting to do that work. And it's spooky, and it's costly, and it kills. Please put more bathrooms downtown. Thank you. Kathy Jaworski, followed by Alice Warner. Hi, um, my name is Kathy Jaworski. I live in Ward 4, so I have no representative up there right now. I'm a former resident of Ward 1, past chair of the Sustainability Commission, and a member of WeCan. And I'm coming to talk about sort of the backstory of why so many people are testifying about the South Willamette planning and the trade-offs that are involved with that. Um, when Councillor Evans' motion to shift planning re resources um, to other neighborhoods first came to my attention, I was pleased. Um, what a breath of fresh air to call out what had long been apparent um, in other neighborhoods. And that is what, that what was intended to be a pilot in South Willamette, a pilot plan that would generate lessons for the whole city, was stuck. It was stuck for a long time with no resolution in sight. And even if the most aggressive of the codes that were originally proposed had been implemented, that would have resulted in 260 units of new housing, which is a drop in the bucket of the need. So um, I had concluded, and this is a bystander, that continuation was a drain on finite resources. We don't have enough to continue to do everything we are and more, at least I don't know the magic of that. Um, and that I, I really feel that that resource could be better applied in other neighborhoods uh, where there's great need for anticipatory planning, where there's a ton of growth, much faster in some places than others, where there's nothing in place to address those needs um, that are brought up by rapid growth without sacrificing livability. My neighborhood in North Eugene is certainly an example of a fast growth neighborhood. However, um, it was originally about where, where to shift, potentially shift versus share versus expand resources for planning. And I, I feel like it's blown up since that point. I'm here to urge you to remember what is in fact at stake, the, the fiscal risk and equity concerns associated with the distractions of questions such as, is this a, a issue of sovereignty of neighborhood organizations versus professional planners? That's not what it is. <laughs> is it an issue of of powerful neighborhoods versus non-powerful neighborhoods, it shouldn't be. Is it an issue of pride, of sunk costs? Should we just keep going? None of those things should be what it's about. What it should be about is how this this motion or any proposal helps us meet, implement critical, already vetted goals that are in Envision Eugene. And I hear the Envision Eugene is being brought about here by people with lots of different points of view. But that should be the driving factor, not short-term trade-offs. Um, for example. In Envision Eugene, we want to expand quality house housing that the average household can afford, manage density, promote walkable neighborhoods, vibrant commercial areas, easy job access while reducing our impact on the environment. How can we apply the lessons that came out of South Eugene in neighborhoods that want them? That's where I hope you will look. So please be open to shifting staff resources to where they're most needed and wanted. Thank you. Thank you. Alice Warner. Followed by Kelsey Moore. Hello, I'm Alice Warner. I live in Councilman Zelenka's ward, and I'm here to talk to you about the transportation plan. I want to thank you for your leadership in passing the Climate Recovery Ordinance. 
the key to that ordinance is, and the beauty of it is that it's based in science, that you established specific targets for greenhouse gas emissions. Now you're voting the transportation plan, but and in order to meet the CRL goals, you're, the city will need big reductions in transportation emissions. The problem is that uh, the most important pieces of the transportation plan are missing. The plan uh, in the section on the goals talks about how many projects um, are climate friendly, what percent of the projects are for walking and for biking, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> What's missing is what greenhouse gas emissions reductions will come with the transportation plan, what will each project impact be on those targets, um, and how and when will you be implementing the plan to reduce greenhouse gases? If you lead the city building infrastructure for walking, for biking, for taking the bus, for carpooling and car sharing, Eugenians will respond. I walk, I bike, I take the bus, but I also need improvements. It's not yet completely safe, and I'm a somewhat marginal uh, transportation person. I'm highly committed um, and what we need to expand the activity is for more infrastructure. So it's time to make the future happen by putting accountable measures into the plan. I hope that in future planning processes which start now as opposed to having started uh, before the climate recovery ordinance that actually the whole system will be reversed. That you start with your greenhouse gas goal and then you figure out what will you need to do or what do we need to do in order to meet that goal instead of adding things at the end as if it's an afterthought. So thank you for the CRO and I hope you will mend the plan. Thank you. Kelsey Moore followed by Stephen Bryan. Hi, thank you, Council and Mayor. Um, my name is Kelsey Moore. I was living in the Friendly neighborhood and I just moved to 24th and Olive, so I don't know who my new council person is, but thank you, Emily. Um, so I'm here to support housing choice, affordability, and denser housing. I grew up in Eugene in, um, in uh, Potter and 26th, and I live in Eugene now and I work at the U of O. Um, I'm having a really hard time finding affordable housing and I by no means make a uh a lot less than other people. I probably make a lot more than some people in Eugene. And it's really concerning. I've had to move twice in the last year because I've had landlords move back into the places I was renting. And I haven't been given much notice and it's been a really challenging to find another place. Um, I really value living in walkable, bikeable neighborhoods. That's really important to me. And I know that's really important to a lot of the people my age as well. Um, I have a lot of young professional friends who also live in Eugene and they're having the same experience. Um, they are renting as well. They would love to own a house, but they are priced out of that market right now. And they're also being priced out of a lot of the rental housing. Um, so I guess I'm here to ask you to um, really honor planning processes that um, support neighborhood density and housing choice. And also, I would like to recognize that um, some of the planning processes that we're in right now really focus on the neighborhood board. And I would say that there's a lack of representation from young people and renters. And I just want to put that out there and say that that's definitely an, an issue. Um, and I guess another thing I'd like to um, ask from the council is to consider how we can support renters. I know that Portland just passed a, a policy that says that renters, if they're getting a no cause eviction, um, the landlord needs to give 90 days and they also need to pay for moving costs. And I would really like to um, ask the council to start thinking how we can support our renting population and how we can make sure that it's um, equitable and affordable and reasonable. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Stephen Bryan, followed by Mel Height. Good evening, uh, councillors, mayor. Um, my name is Stephen Bryan. I live in Ward 1 um, on West Broadway. Uh, I'd just like to add my support for permanent shelters. Uh, at my last um, neighborhood association meeting, we got a presentation from Square One. That sounds like a real success story. Um, 
they're not the only ones. They're not the only ones that are necessary, but something like that multiplied many fold plus others um, just really seems to be necessary to take care of the people that we need to take care of and to create a downtown that's going to be safe and friendly for all. Um, I would recommend um, not only much increased support for organizations like that, but um, uh, they need to be dispersed throughout the city. You can't have them in a clump somewhere. Uh, affordable housing, once again, that needs to be throughout the city. And I would suggest putting a squeeze on the Chamber of Commerce because they benefit from a city that works better. And it will work better if we have sufficient permanent shelter for people. Thank you. Thank you. Mel Height, followed by Tracy Jocelyn. Hello, my name is Mel. Um, I just want to talk about the shelter option. Um, I think that we need to be kind of inventive on how we go about making a shelter. I think um, St. Vincent de Paul and the mission are both great, but they don't fit a lot of people in that program. So I think we need to really think outside the box on how to make it work for more people. Um, I also think that it's really important um, to find somewhere for people who have substance abuse issues to be able to get off the streets and get housing and, and get help that way as well. Um, I think people who have lack of sleep, you know, they aren't able to function properly. Um, as I said before here, um, I was working as an educational assistant and trying to teach the kids but didn't have um, housing. So it was really hard to stay awake and, and focus on them and have them focus on me. So um, I know firsthand what that's like. and. Um, just pushing people around all the time and giving them criminal trespass tickets is not is not working for that. So I'd really like to see um, the shelter and a day center as well. Um, but I think that we need to be really innovative on how we go about doing that so that it fits, like I said, fits more people than what we're serving already because that's not working. So I just want you to think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy Jocelyn, followed by Heather Saliki. Hi, my name is Tracy. I live in Ward 7. I'm moving to Ward 2, Betty Taylor's Ward. I really love everything I heard here tonight, and I'm proud of all the testimony, and I think that a public shelter option is going to happen, so I thank you all for all of your hard work. I think the people who spoke here tonight and how they're part of a solution, um, what Ben said, what Mel just said, what Jennifer said first, just eloquent. I really think that we have the ball rolling. And so what I came up with that is new is if we're tired, and I know I am, then we can think about the youth and that the youth are watching and that it's really important in this crazy current world to show them that there's still hope that you don't have to just drive by Je Washington Jefferson Park. And as an adult, my heart breaks because people need care and people need help when they're down. And we can't just throw people out as victims to, to criminals and drug dealers and there's a lot of good people out there and we need to use their momentum and energy and reason for life and purpose in this shelter. We need to do it a new way where every person has value so that we can show the kids that there is hope in our crazy world. And um, thank you to Reagan Watches and Mia and Mr. Reese for not letting Nightingale Health Sanctuary rest stop fall apart and we're taking a temporary reprieve to check out the car camp program and coming back strong as a rest stop and I wish we could serve more people and we really need a compassion center and an open door brightly colored public rehab shelter day center to let people know that we care about their lives 
and that it's up to them to be a part of their lives by letting them be a part of the public shelter. And thank you to all the people who have been working as community members on the public shelter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Heather Saliki, followed by our final uh, testifier, testifier, which is Julie Lambert. Hello, my name is Heather Saliki. I'm in Ward 2. And I wear a number of different hats in the community. Um, the one I'll be taking off soon is uh, Southeast Neighbors Chair. Being in the association has been a real uh, crash course in uh, civic affairs for me. I'm just so grateful for all the teachers I've encountered um, during my four years um, doing that. Um, one of the things that uh, it's really been is kind of a gateway drug into civic involvement and now I'm on the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Board and I'm involved with a Vulnerable Populations Working Group and the Human Rights Commission, oh, well you know how it goes. So um, what I'm really concerned about though and what, what's continued to really drive me over the past year and a half is our homelessness crisis and um, I'm, I, I am a member of the Human Rights Homelessness Working Group and we've spent so much time um, really thinking about some of the same things you're thinking about is how do we make the most, most use of our public funds? Um, and they're very limited. And what, what I've really come to believe is that um, we, we can really uh, help alleviate a lot of suffering if we have a low barrier indoor public shelter and if we expand support for the existing options we have. Um, I've been really impressed by uh, some of the possibilities that uh, our, our group has come up with. Um, let's start with car camping. Car camping could really be improved. Uh, right now there are 75 people on the waiting list because there aren't enough sp spaces. I, I guarantee you the city of Eugene has a lot of parking spaces. Um, there's a lot of places where people could be in a gravel surface or uh, an occupied lot, but we need to make this program better if we are gonna embrace it. Uh, we need some uh, case management, we need community engagement, um, some aesthetic standards. For example, what about neighborhood association funding? Can we use it to um, apply for some beautification projects that could help to foster community support and pride for car camping sites? Um, when you're looking at neighborhood associations, and all of us are telling you, please involve us in planning, can we also be involved in the planning the units of shelter along with the housing? Because we know it's needed. And we want dust to dawn to be more flexible. It would have been great this winter if we'd have been able to open some family shelter over by the first place uh, family center. Instead, the families had to go to Walmart and push carts up and down the aisles all night to stay keep their kids alive. So we need to be able to say, okay, we're experiencing some extreme weather. Let's uh, let's uh, let's take a dust to dawn site and put it out there um, to meet the need. And, and our rest stops. There's so much community good that can come from rest stops. Um, there are a lot of different ways we could look at them. Um, we're the city for the arts and the outdoors. Um, why aren't we looking at park stewards teams or uh, community arts and music caravans or Occupy Medical Mobile Respite Care or neighborhood park hosts or community guard care? Car <laughs> we have a lot of ideas for you. Join us in the Human Rights Commission. Human, uh, uh, just look to the community. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, Julie Lambert. Um, thank you. Um, hello, council members. Um, I had to write this. Um, <laughs> I see some, some familiar faces and I hope to know the rest of you. Um, my name is Julie Lambert and I represent Homes First Eugene, but mostly the human race. And I try to help out with the Egan Overflow and Occupy Medical and White Bird and others when I can. My ward representative would be all of you, <laughs> as my classification is still in house, but I claim the city of Eugene as my home, and I love it. Thank you for the work that you've done so far for the unhoused. But I ask you to consider the housing first option, at least on a trial basis. I'm concerned with the dignity of the unhoused. I am more so with the loss of, of lives of the unhoused. Um, we're taught that we should love one another, but with the loss of the Right to Rest Act, House Bill 215, resting and sleeping are considered criminal activities. Um, that shouldn't be, it's inhumane, it's counterproductive. 
um, our police officers are wasting their time with citations and arrest. And I got a thousand dollar ticket. If I had a thousand dollars, I wouldn't be by the side of the road. That would not be my first choice. It wouldn't be. Um, so the, the sweeping anti camping ordinance has to go at least until we come up with a better plan. We, and we can come up with one because I don't want an, another one of those citations. Um, there's, the ACLU found out that there's 224 laws that restrict us. Um, we have to relax zoning laws and develop cooperation with Lane County, Lane, um, Lane Community College, 4J, and local neighborhood associations to create housing. I've heard a lot tonight, and a lot of really, a lot of really good things, um, and I appreciate everyone being here. Um, because people are talking about problems that arise with our unhoused brothers and sisters. Wouldn't it be great if we were literally able to change the face of Whitaker and downtown area with the unhoused problem? That'd be great. Things are and have been at an emergency status since 2015. The solution to homelessness to me seems to be housing first. At least consider it on a trial basis. We've got the Conestogas from community supported shelters. We've got the rest stops which are working. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that closes the public hearing. Thank you all for coming. And I'm sure some of the counselors have comments. Councilor Syret. Thank you, I'm still writing. What I want to say. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, who came to speak. I know a lot of folks have left. Um, I'm going to leave uh, side comments on the area planning, refinement plan conversation until we discuss that motion as a council. So, just some quick responses and then um, a note of personal privilege I wanted to offer. Uh, so I did get a notice from the Human Services Commission uh, email list that the Section 8 housing list is going to be open for applications between uh, May 18th and I believe May 24th. So that's good news. It's still a waiting list, but um, that means some spaces have opened up for Section 8 housing in our area. I'm very pleased that we are able to use CD. GB funds for Yapuya Terrace and really appreciate the work of the um, committee that reviewed those proposals. So I'm sure we will adopt that, that in our consent calendar. Uh, we do have some limited funds to support the rest stops and we're working on an RFP process for that. And I hope to increase that funding at some point for sure. I think it's a great program. Uh, we also had an initial work session on renter protections um, and the council will have a follow up work session on that as well to start to try to tackle some of the vulnerability of our uh, renters in our uh, community. And the city has passed a resolution embracing housing first as a model for providing uh, shelter to folks. So we definitely are embracing that. We just haven't had the opportunity to really put it into action in a big way. Um, Lastly, to Jim News comments about the county commissioners uh, not being familiar with the CRO. Not all the county commissioners live in Eugene, um, and they do have a lot on their plate, so it's not surprising to me that they might not be familiar with our climate recovery ordinance, and I suspect a few of them uh, aren't super supportive of our climate recovery ordinance, so just keep that in mind. Um, city manager, I was under the impression that we had a plan to reopen downtown bathrooms with attendance. Is, is that a plan that's being put into place or is it just an idea at this point? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we are in the process of looking at uh, attended restrooms downtown and we can sure give you that update. That would be great. Uh, and then I just wanted to take a moment to uh, just uh, offers a uh, note of personal privilege. Uh, I think as many folks know, I've been receiving treatment for cancer for the last several months. Uh, it's been very successful, I'm happy to say. I do have one last major procedure to go through and I'll be gone basically the first two weeks of May. Um, so I'm just sharing that because since I've been able to attend council meetings, many folks have assumed that I'm past all of that and I'm back full time and I'm not yet. So I just want to, um, uh, make sure folks have the expectation that I will be gone a little bit for still in May, but then I plan to be back 
fully back and fully healthy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Evans. Actually, Mayor, I'll I'll pass. I think my uh, remarks will I'll hold my remarks till later in the agenda. Okay, Councillor Pryor. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. I wanted to acknowledge all the folks that came in and spoke this evening. And, and interestingly, um, I think there is a, a sort of a juxtaposition between the conversation about housing and shelter and the conversation about um, the neighborhood development, because they're really talking about the same thing, which is homes and housing and quality of neighborhoods and how that works. And I can, I can see that combination. And um, I think we'll talk more about the first part of it, but I do appreciate the fact that there is um, an incredible need for more housing. And affordability is an interesting thing because it's a combination of supply and demand. And right now, um, the supply of affordable housing is uh, very minimal. I sit on the Housing Policy Board, which looks at the whole continuum of housing, and that missing middle is a significant part of the complexion of Eugene in terms of what is not available, what is not there for average people to be able to um, access and, and use. Um, and that is a function of a lack of supply, but it's also a high demand. There's a lot of people wanting to come here, and they're willing to pay whatever it takes to come here. And we're not quite Portland yet, but I can foresee a situation where the demand for housing could increase prices dramatically unless there is a available, uh, an available inventory. And so recognizing that issue is where these begin to kind of come together. Um, the mention of uh, 600 tiny homes being built in people's backyards and they are the landlords is a very intriguing idea. Um, if you estimated about $30,000 a piece to build uh, plum and furnish them, uh, that would be about $18 million. Well, you know, that's a lot of money, but let's say you only did 100 of them. Now you're talking about something in a much more affordable range. Um, but we need to modify our uh, building codes and uh, zoning in order to be able to accommodate something like that. It doesn't right now. And we'd have to be able to talk about what kind of specific things we could do with our building codes and our zoning to be able to allow these kind of out of the box and innovative things. So I would look forward to that conversation as well. Great, great. Any other counselors wanting to comment? Okay, I think we'll move on with our agenda then. The first quick piece on the agenda is the consent calendar. Any concerns about the consent calendar? Move to, <laughs> move to approve the items on the consent calendar. Second. Uh, any discussion about that? All in favor of approving the consent calendar? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, we're good on that. Thank you. Okay, next up, um, action resolution declaring the city of Eugene's opposition to anti-Semitic hate and bias crimes. I guess we need this. We need a motion on this because we did not yeah. move uh, last time. I'm, I move to approve resolution 5190, which declares the city of Eugene's opposition to anti-Semitic hate and bias crimes. Second. Uh, discussion? Councilor Pryor? Um, I intend to support the motion for obviously the, the, the message that it sends that we are um, adamantly opposed to this kind of um, activity. But along with that, as I mentioned before, I really do want to consider how we can take more active steps to actually curb this kind of crime, um, to identify, to catch, to prosecute, and to um, uh, convict people who do this kind of stuff. I don't want to just pass an, a resolution that says, yay, we support this idea. I want to follow it up with positive action. If somebody is doing this, I want to catch them, I want to prosecute them, and I want to convict them. And I want to see, and I know that uh, that requires resources, and that's a very difficult conversation, but I'm willing to have that conversation. Councilor Zelenka, Zelenka and then Evans. Okay. Um, I want to uh, also thank Councilor Evans for bringing this forward and working on putting this together. And I'm going to support the motion or the resolution, especially section three of the be it resolved sections, um, where it talks about all the things that we do do already and will continue to do and, and redouble our efforts to uh, to try to combat um, hate crimes and intolerance in our community and discrimination. Okay, Councilor Evans. 
Yeah, I'll speak to the motion. One of the reasons why I brought this resolution forward is because over the last few months, our community has in, has experienced a significant uptick in um, hate graffiti and vandalism throughout the community. But a lot of that uh, graffiti and vandalism has been specifically targeted at our Jewish community. And uh, I've lived in this community for 30 years, and I remember in 1994 when um, the synagogue on Portland Street was uh, sprayed with bullets by neo-Nazis. And in 2002, again, was attacked when uh, neo-Nazis and their ilk uh, threw rocks at the synagogue, broke several windows uh, with, with people who were worshiping inside that facility at that time. Um, understandably, there is a long and very ugly history, not only in this country, but throughout the world in terms of victimizing our Jewish sisters and brothers. And I think it's incumbent upon us to stand up and speak out when these kinds of things uh, tend to trend in a direction that we uh, definitely uh, repudiate. I also want to make note of the fact that last Thursday, um, Jimmy Marr, who is a noted Nazi from uh, a community on the other side of I-5 um, showed up at the University of Oregon to celebrate uh, uh, Hitler's birthday. Uh, so uh, we really need to be hyper vigilant about this kind of activity. Any other comments from counselors? All right. All in favor of passing the resolution? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It passes. None opposed. Thank you. I think it's a. I think it's a very important statement, and I'm I'm uh, proud to be part of a sitting with a council who's passed the statement. So thank you very much. Okay. Next up, we have a motion on the table, actually held over from last Wednesday. So we don't need to. We don't need to float a new motion on South Willamette. There was a friendly amendment to the motion, to motion last time, so we can proceed in a discussion of that motion. Councilor Semple. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to move that we postpone this until Wednesday. It came up very quickly. I'm getting an incredible amount of feedback um, from people in my ward, as well as other parts of the city. I think this is really, really important. Second. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, that's good enough for me. <laughs> uh, any other discussion? Any other comments? Councilor Pryor? Um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, there's still a, a lot of additional information I heard a lot tonight. And while I am uh, sympathetic to Councillor Evans' motion and, and, and at this point still supportive of it, I don't mind the idea of delaying uh, simply to give us more time to kind of digest. And to me, that's the important word is I really want to think about what I've heard. I don't want to have people come and speak tonight and then immediately pass a motion that would look like we hadn't really taken time to consider what was being said. So um, I am I am perfectly willing to postpone the discussion until Wednesday because I think it might give us a little time to reflect and still have a very worthwhile conversation. Councillor Clark. Thank you. I'll support <clears throat> the motion to to postpone as well. Um, it's clear both from the emails and the testimony tonight that there are an awful lot of strong feelings about how we dispose of this next and hearing some of them now, I, I know that the the right wording for how to move forward best isn't clear to everybody at the table. And I think it's 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 wise for us to take a moment, take a breath, and think about how we move forward best. So I'll support that. Any other, any other comments? All right. All in favor of postponing to Wednesday. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, we will postpone till Wednesday, and that closes our meeting. Wait, Thank you. Oh, oh, what about the CDB? That was on, that that was was on the consent calendar. calendar. That was on the consent calendar. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> you were done. Done. Yeah. Consent. <laughs>